Hi, Mike. This is Chris Harrington, Jenny Palmer's brother-in-law. Is Colleen available? I didn't hear the click when Mike disconnected the call because my wife Mary was screaming and pounding relentlessly on the locked door of my home office. I waited two minutes and dialed Mike and Colleen's home phone again. Listen, bastard. If you call this number again, I'm going to report you to the goddamn police. Do you understand? Yeah, Mike. I understand everything. But you need to understand two things. I don't care if you call the police, and more importantly, I'm going to talk to your wife, and there's not much you can do to stop me. Good night, asshole. This time, I hung up the phone with satisfaction. Despite the continued pounding on the door, I leaned back in my office chair, closed my eyes, and tried to make one last big decision for this long roller coaster day. Should I call my sister in law's husband? I asked myself. Asked myself. Asked myself. I met my wife Mary back in high school. I was a junior in high school and was sitting in the bleachers with my buddies waiting for the Friday night soccer game to start. In front of us sat an equally large group of second grade girls. As the game progressed, we took turns going to the concession stand. When my turn came up, I found that a pretty blonde girl named Mary went with me. We carried hot dogs, fries, and sodas, and Mary and I ended up sitting together. She was pretty, smart, had a good sense of humor, and, best of all, she didn't have a boyfriend. In the middle of the third quarter, someone yelled out, Are we going to McDonald's after the game? Everyone almost unanimously agreed that the girls and guys in our group would continue their fun at the nearest McDonald's. Deciding to take a chance, I turned to Mary and asked, I'd rather have pizza than greasy fries. Would you like to go to Tony's Pizza? I was thrilled when she agreed. Mary and I met once a weekend for a few weeks and seemed to enjoy each other's company. After two months of dating, we decided not to break up, and things only got better from there. Mary was my date to the prom, and I walked on clouds as I escorted the most beautiful girl in our school to the dance. I was in seventh heaven until I was in seventh heaven. Two weeks later, on the Monday before prom, I jogged to the tennis courts for team practice. I was running with my roommate, Julie Burke. Julie was on the girls' team. I was a little confused when Julie said, I think you're a really nice guy. Julie, we've known each other all our lives, I replied. Why are you telling me this now? As we were running, she tapped me on the shoulder and said, It's great that you let Mary go to the prom with Jimmy Bay. Otherwise, he's so shy and nerdy, he'd never be able to go. Jimmy Bay was a nice guy, but definitely shy, nerdy, and, I suspect, on the spectrum. He was Mary's neighbor, and she was always looking out for him. I wasn't surprised that Mary agreed to go to the prom, but I was upset that she didn't have the decency to tell me about it. By Friday afternoon, six other people had complimented me on my maturity. They thought it was great that my steady girlfriend could be accompanied to prom by her friend and roommate. Truth be told, I didn't feel mature. It pissed me off that Mary didn't have the courage to tell me about the prom. I knew she would confess during our usual Friday night date. She didn't have a choice. At the last minute on Friday afternoon, I texted her and canceled. I was inundated with messages and voicemails asking me to call her. After a dozen zings on my phone, I finally texted Mary. I've known about your graduation since Monday. At least 10 people have told me. Too bad you weren't among them. I need a girl I can trust. It's not you. I turned my phone off and pouted. N Mary and I didn't get back together until the beginning of the next school year. It was a Friday afternoon, and I was heading to my car in the student parking lot. Mary was sitting on the hood of my car when I approached her. Will you let your ex-girlfriend buy you ice cream at the Dairy Queen? She inquired. That was the beginning. For the next two years, we were exclusive. During the second year, we had a long-distance relationship as I was in college in New York. I was able to come home often and was thrilled to exchange my virginity on a Saturday night in March, shortly after her 18th birthday. We dated Mary until she left for college the following year. Two weeks after her freshman year began, I received a letter from Dear John. It seemed she was having too much fun in college and didn't want to be tied down to a steady boyfriend. 
I never called or wrote. I was popular, getting very good grades and playing Division III tennis. I replaced Mary with a steady stream of girls starting the next night. I didn't see Mary until two years after she graduated from college. I was working as a staff engineer for a local defense contractor, and after a long week, I was out with fellow employees. I literally ran into her at a bar. We talked for a few minutes and then we each went back to our friends. I'll admit, I kept my eyes on her for the next hour and couldn't decide whether or not to follow her into the parking lot when her group started to disperse. I chuckled when Mary's friends left. She walked over to the bar, sat on a stool, and ordered a drink. When she was served, she turned the stool around so it was across from me and stared at our table. I watched with a goofy grin as guys approached her but were quickly rebuffed. It wasn't until she looked me straight in the eye and held up two fingers that I pulled away from my friends. I needed to wait for Mary to tell the other guy to get the hell out before I got anywhere near her. Two? I asked. Mary smiled and replied, Yes. If you had let two more guys ask me out, I would have accepted his invitation. Mary and I dated for almost six months, after which we became exclusive and moved in together. Ten months later, we were married and have lived a happy and totally fulfilling life for almost five years. My day started early. At 7.30 a.m., I had a meeting with a longtime client and friend. We were meeting downtown at the Marriott Hotel in New Haven, Connecticut, home to a stunningly overrated university whose name begins with the letter Y. Tony was already seated in the conference room I had reserved. We chatted for a few minutes while I set up my laptop, laid out all the necessary paperwork, and poured hot black coffee into a mug. Tony is a civilian contractor who has been assigned by his company to work on the propulsion system for the U.S. Navy's next-generation submarines. I'm a senior mechanical engineer. My company is a defense contractor specializing in marine mechanics. We have successfully worked together on three small but important contracts over the past few years. For whatever reason, we were each getting pushback from our immediate superiors about our ongoing negotiations. We were told that we had one more chance to resolve the seven remaining critical issues before other people in our companies took over the negotiations. Tony and I worked until just before lunch and finally took a deep breath at 2.15 p.m. Do you think your company will agree this time? I shrugged and told him, Honestly, I can't understand why our last two offers weren't accepted. Tony inquired, You and I have grown close over the past few years. Do you think this might be a test to see if we're too close? I grinned and admitted, I was thinking the same thing before stretching tiredly and shrugging again. How about a drink? asked Tony. I picked up my notebook and said, I've got over 30 pages of notes to sort through. A drink isn't going to make it any easier. I'm going to hang out and transcribe important resolutions into my notebook. I'll email you a memo of understanding by 9 tomorrow morning. Let's get on the phone right away if there are any misunderstandings. I have to submit my report by noon tomorrow. Sounds good. Tony said, starting to assemble his computer. I escorted Tony through the hotel lobby and, after he left, went into the gift store and bought a Diet Coke before heading back to the conference room. As soon as I entered the room, it felt like the walls closed in around me. Determined to have a change of scenery, I packed my bag and moved to a quiet corner of the hotel lobby. I contacted the office and found out that there had been a small problem during the morning. Afterward, I texted my wife and suggested that she have dinner without me. I settled into a comfortable chair in the lobby and got to work. The change of scenery did me good, and over the next few hours I was able to get a lot of work done. I was so focused that I still wonder how her laughter caught my attention. I looked up and recognized Jenny, my sister-in-law, walking through the hotel lobby in a traditional little black dress and heels. She was heading straight for the check-in area. If that wasn't strange enough, her arm was encircled by the arm of a tall, handsome man. The man was not Jenny's husband, Scott. Without hesitation, I turned on the camera app on my phone and snapped a few shots of the couple while they were checking in. Eh? I took another series of shots as they walked to the elevator and a final series of shots as they entered the elevator. When the elevator door closed, 
I quickly walked over and watched as the indicator light showed that they exited on the eighth floor. I was angry and confused. I loved Jenny and considered her husband my best friend. Admittedly, I sat in a daze, leaning back in my chair. The stress of the day's negotiations and the shock of seeing Jenny with another man had left my mind reeling. I didn't notice the man sitting in the chair next to me until he held out his hand to me. He said, Hi, my name is James. I'm the general manager of the Marriott Hotel. As we shook hands, I replied, Hi, James. I'm Chris Harrington. I've rented conference room L-122 today. James nodded in understanding and then asked, I saw you taking pictures of a couple who had just checked in. Do you know them? After a moment, I answered, I know the woman. May I assume you were surprised to see her with a beau friend? I was very surprised, I said to James. Mr. Harrington, may I be frank? After I nodded, he continued, I'm worried that there will be trouble if you stay here. I've never gotten into the kind of trouble you're talking about. I've never even come close. There will likely be a confrontation, but I'll leave before we disturb your guests. James looked around the lobby. It was fairly quiet, and no one seemed to be paying any attention to us. He held out a folded piece of paper to me. I unfolded it and found the man's name and address printed on the paper. James asked, Do you think there might be even less confrontation now that you have this information? I held out my hand, and as we shook it, I said, I can almost guarantee it. I went back to work and managed to get a surprising amount done, considering I was glancing toward the elevator every few seconds. Hey. By the time Jenny and her boyfriend got off the elevator, almost three hours had passed. My bag was packed and I was already on my feet and walking towards them before they took two steps into the lobby. I held my cell phone to my face and snapped pictures as I approached the couple. Jenny was confused at first, but when I put the camera down, her jaw dropped and she visibly paled. Chris, what the hell are you doing here? I'm here for meetings. Why are you here? I could see Jenny trying to calm down. She paused and said, Chris, I'd like you to meet Mike Charmuth. We work together. We're here to check out some conference rooms for an upcoming event our agency is hosting. I looked at Mike as he extended his hand to me. Nice to meet you, Chris. I ignored his hand and asked, Mike, yes? Can I ask you a question? Mike and Jenny exchanged tense looks before I asked, Do you think Jenny is more attractive in those jeans, blouse, and boots? I waved my hand, pointing to the way Jenny was dressed at the moment. Or the black dress she was wearing when you went to the eighth floor to look at the meeting rooms three hours ago? Before they could return to their thoughts, I looked at Mike's left hand. That's a beautiful wedding ring, Mike. I can see you're just as much a lying, cheating pile of shit as my precious sister-in-law. At this point, poor Mike lost his composure. Hissing, he said, Listen, asshole, you have no idea what's going on. Just mind your own business, and I won't kick your ass. I'm sorry to tell you, Mike, but my whore sister-in-law cheating with a worthless asshole like you is my business. I slowly put both hands behind my back and continued. As for the ass-kicking, I'll give you a free first punch. You better make it good, because after you make your kick, I'm going to beat the shit out of you, put you in the hospital, and then call the police and charge you. I stopped talking and smiled. Mike jerked his head toward Jenny and said angrily, Can you handle that asshole? I have to go. Without waiting for an answer, he turned toward the front door of the hotel and walked away. I couldn't help myself. As Mike walked toward the front door of the hotel, I said, If I were you, I'd warn your wife that I'll be calling. Mike stopped and slowly turned around. Directing his gaze at Jenny, he repeated, Please take care of this, Jenny. After watching Mike walk out of the hotel, Jenny turned, put her hand on my arm and said, Chris, can we go to the bar and have a drink? I was tempted, but quickly decided against it. I'm sorry, Jenny. I've wasted hours waiting for you to finish your party. Jenny flinched as I continued. I need to get home, get a drink, and decide how to tell Scott and Mike's wife about everything. Jenny squeezed my hand and pleaded, 
I only do that when Scott isn't home. It doesn't mean anything. I'm not hurting Scott. How long have you known me, Jenny? She didn't answer but stared intently into my eyes. I think at least a dozen years since I first met Mary in high school. Sound about right? After the silence dragged on, I said angrily to Jenny, And in all that time, what made you think I wouldn't tell my best friend that his wife was a lying, cheating whore? Turning to leave, I caught a glance from James, the hotel manager. He gave me a grateful nod as I squeezed through the revolving door. Rush hour traffic was over, and I began the half-hour drive north on I-91, toward home. I set the cruise control to 78 miles per hour and turned up the volume on the country music station. The only annoyance during the trip was the constant ringing and beeping of my cell phone. It sounded like my wife was urgently trying to reach me. I pulled into our garage and closed the door behind me. As I got out of the car, I heard the voice of my wife, Mary. She was standing in the open doorway leading from the garage to the kitchen of the condominium. Where the hell have you been? She inquired. I slipped past her and made my way into the kitchen. Dumping my work supplies on the countertop, I noticed Mary's cell phone lying on the kitchen table next to a half-full glass of wine. I picked up the phone, typed her password on the keypad, and opened her text messages. I saw that the message I had sent hours ago had been read, so I said, You know where I've been. You read the message. That's not what I meant and you know it. N Heading into the den to pour a couple fingers of bourbon, I said over my shoulder, then tell me what you mean. When I returned to the kitchen, Mary was sitting at the table. She asked, what did you do to upset Jenny? As far as I know, I haven't done anything to upset Jenny. Jenny, on the other hand, has upset me a lot. I watched Mary gather her thoughts as I sat across from her. Did you know Jenny was cheating on Scott? My direct question caught her off guard. She said it was just one time. Well, that's a lie, I told Mary. Jenny told me she only cheats when Scott is on the road. After a brief pause, I continued. I noticed you didn't answer my question. Did you know your sister was cheating on Scott? Mary sighed, took a healthy sip of wine and said, Chris, that's between Scott and Jenny. I smiled and said to Mary, That's the first thing you said that I agree with. It's between Scott and Jenny. My problem is that Scott doesn't know there is a problem that needs to be solved. Damn it! This is none of your business! exploded Mary. I want you to keep your mouth shut. I leaned forward and rested my elbows on the kitchen table. Putting the fingers of both hands together in a prayerful manner, I said, You know me, Mary. You know me better than anyone else. Mary expected more and was startled when I stood up and walked quickly toward the kitchen archway. I hesitated for a moment before turning around. I asked you twice if you knew about Jenny's affair, and you refused to answer. I'll ask you again. How long have you known? You know Jenny. She's always been a little wild. Zero to three was my immediate response. What the hell does that mean? It means you refuse to answer a question that I think is very important to our marriage. What Jenny does when Scott isn't home has no bearing on our marriage, declared Mary confidently. Well, we'll see about that. I leaned against the archway and counted on my fingers. First of all, my relationship with your sister will never be the same, now that I know she's a lying whore. At every holiday we celebrate with your family, I will be reminded of your sister's betrayal. Secondly, you've made it clear to me that you knew of her vile behavior, and I'm left wondering if you approve of it. That's not fair, Chris. Third, although I don't travel as much as Scott, I've been on the road one trip a month. For the first time in our relationship, I have to wonder if you're cheating on me. Mary's eyes got huge and she exploded. How dare you accuse me of cheating? I immediately jumped up and replied with equal force. I never accused you of cheating but your cavalier attitude toward your sister's debauchery makes me wonder if you are. I paused and looked at my wife before continuing. We both know you can't prove you haven't cheated. All I have is my trust in you, and right now that trust is severely shaken. 
I turned and walked down the hall to my home office. After typing Mike Charmuth's information online, making sure he was married, and intercepting both calls to his home phone, I decided to do one last horrible thing. I texted my brother-in-law, Scott. You're coming home on Friday, am I right? Ten minutes passed before he replied, Yes, I'm flying in at 2.30 p.m. Meet me at the pit stop. I'll be there at 4. Does this have anything to do with the frantic call from Jenny who wanted to know if we'd talked? Scott inquired. I was trying to decide what to answer when suddenly the phone rang. Hi, Scott, I answered, turning my chair to face the wall. I wasn't going to keep my words from Mary, but I didn't want her to hear this conversation through a closed door either. What's going on, Chris? It's as bad as it can get, Scott. Are you sure you want to talk about this over the phone? After a brief pause, Scott asked, Is she cheating on me? I replied, Yes. The silence lasted a few minutes, broken only by occasional sobs. I'll see you at the pit, he said. The call was immediately cut off. I was going to text Scott and let him know I was willing to talk to him anytime, but in the end, I decided to leave my friend alone. I was sure he knew I had his back and would be available anytime he needed me. While I was talking to Scott, Mary had gone quiet. I'm sure she was trying to listen. As I hung up the phone, I heard her say through the closed door, Please come into the kitchen. We need to talk. I had already considered going to the guest bedroom, but decided to finish my bourbon while sitting on the kitchen table. Settling into the kitchen chair across from Mary, I took a good sip of Knob Creek and felt a slight burning sensation in my throat. I looked at my wife and saw the wheels spinning frantically in her head, preparing for the next attack. My brain was dead. I had no energy left to fight, and I knew the last ounce of alcohol wouldn't help. I was waiting for Mary to start when my cell phone buzzed in my pocket. Jesus! I exploded. When is this damn day going to end? I pulled out my phone, looked at the screen, and saw an unfamiliar number, which added to my frustration. I answered the call with an aggressive, Hello. A woman answered, I'm sorry to call so late. My name is Colleen Charmuth. Someone from this number has called my home twice this evening. These calls have been very upsetting to my husband, and I suspect the caller was trying to reach me. Sighing, I told her, Colleen, my name is Chris Harrington. I called earlier and tried to speak to you. Colleen said in a somewhat somber tone, Let me guess. You're calling to tell me that my husband is cheating with your wife. Almost, I told her. He's cheating with my sister-in-law. Her name is Jennifer Palmer, and I think they work together. A long pause followed before she answered. This is the third time I've gotten a call like this, and it will be the last. How can a man do this to his wife and four children? I knew the question was rhetorical, so I offered instead. I have pictures of them checking in together at the New Haven Marriott Hotel downtown, kissing in the elevator as the door closed, and returning to the lobby almost three hours later. Jenny was dressed differently after their, uh, date. The rest of the conversation passed in an exchange of email addresses and a promise that I'd send pictures in the morning. Hanging up, Mary said, Jenny told me he's in an open marriage. That's a lie. His wife and four children believe they have a monogamous marriage and a happy family. Mary looked shocked, pressing her hands to her face. I continued. Apparently, this is the third time she's caught him cheating. She's going to divorce him. Mary stared at me, stunned. I swirled the last of the bourbon in the glass and then tipped it into my mouth. Rinsing the glass in the sink, I headed for our bedroom. Lying in bed and reflecting on everything that had happened to my extended family over the past few hours, I came to the conclusion that I wasn't to blame for all the sadness and destruction. As usual, my alarm clock rang at 5 in the morning. Instead of starting the day with exercise in our basement gym, I took a quick shower, got dressed, and headed to work. I wasn't trying to get away from Mary. I needed to get to the office, finalize the memorandum of understanding, and give it to Tony. Thursday was busy. Tony and I had to talk on the phone for 45 minutes to clarify the wording on a few points, but I had no trouble getting the finished agreement to my boss by noon. 
I spent the afternoon going through the previous day's emails and headed home at 5 p.m., my usual dismissal time. I wondered what the evening would bring, and was only half surprised when, as I turned down our street, I saw Jenny and her parents' car parked in front of my house. This is going to be a long damn night, I moaned, pushing the button to open the garage door. What the hell did you say to Scott? began Jenny as I closed the door behind me. Looking at my startled wife, I said, I'm going to go change. I'll be back in a few minutes, but I'm warning you. If your family disrespects me in my house, I will physically throw everyone out the front door, including you, Mary. And I didn't wait for a response and hurried down the hall to our bedroom. After contemplating the cowardly act of climbing out the bedroom window, I decided to face Mary and her family. It was hard to walk alongside an open bottle of bourbon, but I figured it was better to have a clear head. My second thought was, screw it. So I went back to the bar. One inch didn't seem like enough, and two inches exceeded my limit for polite conversation, so I settled on an inch and a half of my favorite amber liquid. All eyes were on me as I re-entered the kitchen. Everyone was sitting around the table. There was an empty seat between Mary and her father, Steve. Instead of sitting down, I leaned against the kitchen counter, watching those gathered and wetting my lips with my drink. I liked my in-laws. They were good, solid men. Steve, my father-in-law, was a man I respected. He was direct, honest, and you always knew what he thought of you. If you stayed on his side, there was no better friend in the world. On the other hand, if you crossed him, I was sure he could make your life miserable. Steve considered Scott and I friends. My mother-in-law considered herself a hard-ass and an extraordinary businesswoman. She owned and operated a well-known local real estate franchise with an excellent reputation. Although Betty oversaw the day-to-day -day operations of the business, everyone involved knew that Steve was the brains behind its success. Perhaps you'd be more comfortable sitting here? Mary patted the chair next to her. I've been sitting all day. I'm fine where I am. Jenny already had some control over her emotions. She asked, What did you tell Scott? I thought for a second before answering. I texted him and asked him to meet me tomorrow when he got home. I told him it was urgent. Gathering my thoughts, I continued. Scott called and wanted to know what was wrong. After I confirmed that he wanted to talk on the phone, I told him that you were cheating on him. He cried for several minutes before he could confirm that he would meet with me. I was somewhat surprised at how devastated the family seemed. Mary was crying and said, I begged you to mind your own business. Santa, I wondered if her statement was made for the good of the family. I replied, and I told you it was my business. My mother-in-law jumped up and said, that's debatable. Before I could comment, Jenny asked, are you going to see Scott tomorrow? Yes. What are you going to tell him? She inquired. I replied, I don't have anything else to tell him. I sent him the pictures I took and told him you were with Mike for just under three hours. I sent him Mike's name and address as well as his wife's contact information. I guess I'll be a support and a shoulder for him to cry on. What about me, Chris? queried Jenny. Don't I deserve support too? I smiled, looking around the table. I think you have plenty of support, Jenny. I'm going to stick with Scott's opinion on this one. How do you know Scott isn't cheating on Jenny while he's traveling? Married men often cheat when they are away from home, commented Betty, the girl's mother. While I can't imagine Scott cheating, to be honest, I have to admit that I have no idea how he acts when he's away. Until yesterday, I had never considered the idea that Jenny was a cheater or that my wife might be cheating on me. The table exploded with how dare you, and that's inappropriate. Mary was visibly shocked by my statement, so I stepped into the conversation and continued. At least I was forthright and told Mary that last night. Her cavalier and dismissive attitude towards Jenny's cheating bothers me. Steve, the girl's father, told me, Mary never cheated on you. I can't believe you think so badly of her. I knew I had to be careful what I said next. I didn't want to turn Steve against me. I purposely lowered the volume and harshness of my voice, looked Steve in the eye and challenged, prove it. After a few moments of silence, I continued. 
That's the thing, Steve. You can't prove that Mary didn't cheat on me. I raised my hand as the protests began. All I have is six years of absolute trust in Mary. I told her last night that my trust in her has been shaken. That's not fair, Chris. I jumped up before Mary could finish. I asked you three times last night if you knew that Jenny was cheating on Scott. You refused to answer my question. Instead, you changed the subject. You didn't lie, but you were dishonest. Yes. I looked at Mary as she admitted. I knew about Jenny's affairs. I didn't support her, but I didn't want to create a mess. Like this. She waved her hands, pointing to our current problems. I was hoping her affairs would go her way, and Scott wouldn't find out. I nodded. Although I was greatly disappointed that Mary was covering up her sister's infidelity, I could understand her protecting her sister. Remember our conversation about the exclusive relationship a few weeks before you proposed to me? Asked Mary. When I nodded, she looked me straight in the eye and said, Honestly, I haven't had a romantic or intimate relationship since our conversation. Furthermore, I haven't been with another man since we started dating after college. Call me naive, but in her words, I saw the angel I'd married five years ago. I love you and believe you, I told my fiancé. Mem, her family was kind enough to give us a few moments of respite before we continued our conversation. I could tell that Steve was especially happy about this turn of events. Betty asked, What are you going to do about Scott? I'm just going to support my best friend, just as each of you will support Jenny. Scott deserves my support, and I'm going to give it to him. The next six weeks passed in a hectic pace. Scott moved out of his house and into a neighboring apartment. He immediately filed for an official separation from Jenny, but did not file for divorce. I had dinner with Scott every Wednesday, while Mary kept the same schedule with her sister. It was Tuesday, and I was having lunch with a couple of work buddies at Clyde's Barbecue Bar. We were seated at a table for four when some man pushed back an empty chair and sat across from me. Hey, asshole. I bet you forgot about me. And it took a few bars before I could match the name to the face. Hey, Mike. I heard Colleen dumped your cheating ass. What's it like being an absentee dad? He grinned and said, Screw you, asshole. It's your fault. I looked at my friends, Carl and Joe, and saw that they were mildly amused. Turning my attention back to Mike, I replied, Yes, your divorce is my fault. Mike laughed and admitted, I guess it's partly my fault too, but there are so many married women around that I can't stay faithful. I was starting to feel bad about Mike's answer when he continued, I guess my specialty is entertaining married people. Mike nudged Carl to his right. That's exactly what I did to Jenny, his sister-in-law. When her deadbeat husband left town, I shared her and traded her with friends. He winked and told me, she was very popular. His smirk left no doubt that the conversation would continue. Reaching into his back pocket, he pulled out an envelope and tossed it on the table, next to my plate. That's the kind of envelope that holds pictures. Mike's smirk told me all I needed to know about the contents. I admit my heart shattered into a thousand pieces, but I'd be damned if I'd let that asshole see me stumble. I picked up the envelope and slipped it into my tracksuit pocket. Trying to provoke me, Mike asked, Aren't you going to show it to your friends? He laughed again. What's the matter, asshole? Don't you have anything to say? I gritted my teeth, but I needed to answer. I said, You're probably the dumbest asshole in the world. He was still grinning from ear to ear when I told him. When I give Jenny Scott's husband those pictures, he's going to file for divorce. Since you are Jenny's immediate supervisor, how long do you think it will take for him to sue you and your company? You'll be out of a job in a week. It was hard, but I started laughing. The idiot realized he had underestimated me and was contemplating his next move when I said, Do you know I grew up in this town? What do I care where you grew up? This asshole was in big trouble, but I was in no hurry. I know everyone who moves and shakes the city. Mike didn't look very impressed, so I continued. I also know the meanest pieces of shit. I'd like to suggest you get out of town while your legs are still working. Screw you. 
I'm not afraid of you. I have witnesses that you threatened me. He pointed at Carl and Joe. They both laughed and Joe said, He really is an idiot. You're going to get divorced and lose your kids. You'll be fired from your job and you'll be paying child support and alimony. And most importantly, I would advise you to look over your shoulder. Soon. Someday soon, you'll be in a world of hurt. Mike smugly pushed back his chair, stood up and said, Screw you, asshole. You're nothing but a weak cuckold. My thoughts were spiraling out of control as Mike walked away. Later, back in my office, I did look at the pictures and was convinced of the most grotesque details imaginable to a happily married man. The video was even worse and crushed my soul. Gathering my thoughts and pushing aside the overwhelming sadness and anger, I called Scott and asked him to meet me for dinner. After another 15 minutes spent thinking about it, I invited the other man to join Scott and me. Tears came to my eyes as I sat at the table and continued to outline my plans. I realized that acting normal around Mary was going to be impossible. I needed to get away. I traveled almost once a month on business for my company. Half of my trips were planned in advance. The other trips were urgent and made at the last minute. I texted Mary. Whitaker's account is in trouble. I'm going to the airport. Scott and I had a very quiet dinner that night. After ordering a beer, I handed him the small stack of photos Mike had given me the day before. Scott was equally devastated for both himself and me. We agreed that divorce was the only option that worked for us and discussed the possibility of suing the insurance agency that Jenny and Mike worked for. In the end, we decided to take the advice of our divorce attorney. We had been sitting at our table for over an hour when I saw Sal Morello walk into the bar. He looked around the room, spotted me, and headed in our direction. He stopped to shake hands and have a few words with people at different tables. Sal was a generation older than Scott and me. His daughter Trish went to our school a year behind me. Sal owned a large auto parts warehouse outside of town. Fifteen years earlier, when I was 16, I was practicing my serve on the high school tennis courts one summer afternoon. Trish waved to me as she biked past the courts. A few minutes later, as I was picking up balls scattered around the court, I looked up to see five classmates forcibly pushing Trish under the bleachers of the baseball field about a hundred yards away. I guessed what those assholes were thinking, and I knew Trish wasn't that kind of girl. I ran out of the ballpark and within seconds, I was under the bleachers. Trish's shirt was ripped off. She was screaming and crying and trying to cover herself while the assholes pulled her shorts down. Stan Malloy turned just in time for the rim of my racket to hit him in the nose. It exploded. Blood splattered in all directions and Stan let out a piercing scream as he fell to the ground. My backhand hit Joey Burns in the cheek and he passed out. I don't remember much after that. The three remaining assholes grabbed me and shook the shit out of me as I lay there. After they managed to land the last few blows, they got scared and ran away. Trish continued to cry, and I tried to come to my senses. We left Trish's bike in the field, and she helped me get to the car. I could barely drive, but eventually pulled up to her house. My car hadn't come to a complete stop yet when Trish jumped out of the front seat and ran screaming into the house. I had to get out of the car and go around her to close the door that Trish had left open. As I was closing the door, I heard a rumble and turned toward the house. Running towards me was a huge bull. His face looked ready to kill. It wasn't until he was close that he noticed the damage on my face and my hunched posture. You're Harrington's baby, he growled after me. I could barely nod. I told him, I think I need an ambulance, Mr. Morello. I leaned against the car and slowly and painfully sank to the ground. Mr. Morello turned and shouted toward the house, Call an ambulance, now! Mr. Morello knelt down beside me, took my chin in his hand, and turned my head until our eyes met. What the hell happened to my daughter? He wanted to know. Some assholes dragged her under the bleachers at the baseball field. That was you? He barked. I groaned, shaking my head. I was practicing on the tennis court next to the field. Every word was painful. 
Fire flashed in his eyes as he asked, What did those bastards do to my... He couldn't finish the sentence. When I got there, they had already pulled her shirt off. They were trying to get her pants off. She was still wearing her bra and shorts. If I hadn't been in so much pain, I'm sure his icy stare would have scared the hell out of me. I want to know their names. Stan Malloy and Joey Burns will be in the hospital when I get there. I smashed their faces with my racket. I gave him the names of the other three assholes as an ambulance and a police car pulled up behind my car. Mr. Morello leaned over and we ended up nose to nose. I could smell the garlic in his breath. In a voice just above a whisper, he said, If you ever need a favor, come see Sal Morello. When Sal approached our table, he sat down without any introduction. I handed him an envelope of photos and waited for him to look through them. When he looked up at me, I said, There's a man here by the name of Michael Charmuth. He works for Jimmy Sullivan's insurance agency. His hobby is turning married women into whores and sharing them with his friends. In the pictures I showed you, he and his gang are with my wife and my brother-in-law's wife. Sal nodded understandingly, and I continued. I hope someday he won't be so handsome, his gait will be less athletic, and he'll have other problems. For several minutes, the three of us sat in silence before Sal uttered a single sentence. Since both of you will soon be single, it would be wise for you to join a gym. Perhaps you'll decide to head straight to the gym from work every... every... evening. You can work out together for a few hours and then go out and have a nice dinner. He looked at our confused faces carefully before he finished. You idiots think you can have a solid alibi every night? When he was finally sure we understood what he said, he rolled his eyes, nodded to me, stood up, and slowly walked out of the bar. I didn't drive home since I told Mary I was out of town. Instead, I stayed the night at the nearby Marriott Hotel. I was able to speak directly to my boss, and I briefly told him my concerns. He agreed to allow me to work remotely and send my team an email letting them know I was leaving on a business trip the following week. An uncomfortable chair in the corner of the hotel room called to me. I sank into the chair, closed my eyes, and reflected on the past weeks. It was obvious to me that because of the hard line I had taken with her sister, Mary couldn't divulge information about her affair with Mike and his friends. She knew with absolute certainty that I would divorce her. Mary was right, but as I pondered the divorce equation, I thought to myself hopefully I'd be fair if she was honest and forthright. Instead, Mary continued to lie to me. I had to learn of her betrayal in a public setting, surrounded by my friends and co-workers. I can't imagine a scenario more disrespectful and humiliating than sitting in front of my wife's pimp and finding out she was a gang slut. She was extremely unfair to me, and as a result, our divorce would not have been fair. Instead, I realized that I had to crush Mary. I swore to myself that I would destroy my wife, my love, and my best friend in the same extreme way. A divorce that could be called amicable did not exist for Mary. I struggled to get out of my chair, walked over to the office desk in the corner of the hotel room, and began to make plans. Until almost 1.30 in the morning, I strategized my pre-divorce course of action regarding my lying and cheating whore wife. If my plan was unsuccessful, her heart would be broken. On the other hand, if things worked out the way I had planned, this cunt would be left broken and in a heap on the side of the road. The next morning, I was able to make an appointment with a divorce attorney for the following day. Despite the attorney's recommendation, I did not split our finances. That would have to wait. I moved into an extended stay hotel and set up a remote office. Until Friday, I ignored phone calls and texts from Mary. At that point, I simply texted her that I was going away for the weekend. Her response was extremely upset, and all weekend she called and begged me to call her back. Over the weekend, I was able to buy everything I needed for my plan. After everything was ready, on Sunday, I headed to the mountains for a long hike. When I got back to the hotel, I turned on my phone and I started getting messages and calls from Mary, all of her family members, and several co-workers. 
Apparently, Mary was extremely upset that I was out of sight and was trying to track me down. On Monday and Tuesday, I worked from my hotel room. I was trying to tie up loose ends since I would be out of the office the next day. On Wednesday, it was D-Day. After breakfast, I checked out of my hotel and headed home. On the way, I drove through the parking lot of Mary's employer to make sure her car was at work. I also put a GPS device under her seat. It took a few hours to set up the necessary equipment and props at home, and by early afternoon, I was done. At 2 p.m., I started a fire in our living room fireplace. Mary and I often liked to sit by the fire on winter weekend evenings. We'd sip wine, talk, and snuggle up to each other as we watched the flames jump in the fireplace. But today wasn't a chilly February day. It was September, and the temperature outside at the start of the day was 84 degrees. Say, I waited until 3 o'clock in the afternoon and sent Mary a text. Just got home. My phone immediately rang. I transferred Mary's call to voicemail, but she didn't leave a message. Instead, she texted me a message. Bastard. I kept an eye on the GPS indicator on my laptop. I expected Mary to leave work immediately, but she didn't. She was going to show me. The fire was blazing, and I continued to add logs to the top of the pile. At 5.05 p.m., when the GPS indicated that Mary had started on her way home, the temperature in the living room was stifling and easily over 100 degrees. Perfect, I thought to myself. My heart clenched. I gritted my teeth and waited for that crap to come home. Three minutes passed from the time Mary opened the garage door until she walked into the kitchen. I heard her drop her briefcase by the door and felt her presence as she stood in the passage to the living room. She entered and found me sitting on the sofa watching the fire. On the table in front of the couch was a plate of cheese and crackers and a bottle of wine. I held one glass of wine in my hands. The second glass was on the other end of the table and was meant for Mary. What the hell are you doing? It's getting incredibly hot, commented Mary. Turning from the fire to look at Mary, I asked, What the hell do I look like I'm doing? I've prepared a romantic reception for my wife. I noticed two beads of sweat already dripping down her forehead and cheek. A romantic... The words stuck in her throat, and she didn't finish the sentence. Instead, she took a few steps toward the fire, bent down, and picked up a half-burnt object from a rock. Taking it in her hands, she studied it carefully, and then took a step back and looked at the top shelf of the bookcase. I thought she might hurt her back. So quickly she turned to face me. Her eyes widened with horror as she showed me the smoldering cover of the book. It was the only part of the book that had escaped the flames. It didn't look like Mary was in any condition to utter words, so I calmly told her, We didn't have any kindling to start the fire so I used a couple of these old books. I nodded at the empty spot on the top shelf where Mary kept a number of books. I only used four or five. We have plenty more to start the next fire. As I spoke, I got up from the couch, picked up Mary's wine glass, and held it out to her. I watched her face turn from incomprehension to fury. The day Mary was born, her dad had given her a gift. The gift turned out to be the most popular children's book of the previous year. On the first blank page, Daddy wrote Mary a love letter in which he heartfeltly described his hopes and dreams for his daughter. Every year, Daddy gave her the same gift for her birthday. She had 28 books, each one a reminder of her father's love. I clenched my jaws as I saw Mary cringe and start to sway. I wasn't sure if she meant to slap me or punch me. When her hand hit my face, it hurt like hell. Her hand crashed into my left eye, and her nails tore through the skin on my cheek. The contents of two glasses of wine poured down the front of my shirt and pants. Her face changed again, and as she began to cry, I saw complete confusion again. Without a word, she turned and ran up the stairs to our bedroom on the second floor. I heard the door slam shut behind her. Although I was devastated since I knew my marriage was over, I still smiled. My plan had worked just fine. When I looked in the bathroom mirror, I saw that my eye was red and beginning to swell. 
Mary's fingernails had punctured my skin, and a trickle of blood ran down my cheek. Let's get this over with, I said to myself, pulling my cell phone out of my pocket and dialing a number. 911, what's your emergency? I heard on the other end. My name is Chris Harrington, and I need police assistance for a domestic situation. My wife has physically assaulted me. After giving the dispatcher my address, she asked, Are you in a safe location, Mr. Harrington? Yes. My wife has locked herself in our bedroom. I'll be sitting on the porch until the police arrive. Do you need medical attention? The dispatcher asked. No, I'm not that badly hurt. According to police procedure, the dispatcher stayed on the line until the first police car arrived. I knew my call was being recorded and was very careful how I answered her questions. Almost immediately after the first patrol car pulled up to the curb, a second car pulled up. The three police officers crossed the grass together. Thanks for coming, officers. What's going on? The old veteran asked. Sam Nick. I turned my head so they could see the damage on my left side. My wife Mary hit me. Why did she hit you? He inquired. I wanted to be careful with my answer. I told him. In the last few months, my wife has become verbally abusive. I suspect she is in a state of conflict. She is hiding an affair that she thinks I don't know about. In fact, I was planning on serving her with divorce papers tonight. When we talk to your wife, will we discover any damage? I have never touched my wife or any other woman in anger, was my honest answer. One of the young officers asked, Are there any weapons in your house? I have several handguns. They are all kept in a gun safe in my office. My wife does not have the combination to the safe. When two young officers entered my house to talk to Mary, I said to the third, Would you like to see a videotape of my wife beating me? He squinted, trying to make sense of my statement. Several bars passed before he asked, Do you have proof of the assault? I haven't looked. I think I have proof. Finished, I waved for him to follow me. My laptop was on the kitchen table. I needed to wake up my computer and find my cloud storage account. I opened the folder, rewound the video back 30 minutes, and found the beginning of our confrontation. I hit the play button and stepped aside so the policeman could get a good view of what was happening. He watched until Mary left the room and ran upstairs, and then asked to watch it again. After the second viewing, he pressed the communicator button on his shoulder and said, Arrest Mrs. Harrington. Almost immediately, I heard Mary screaming from upstairs and my heart raced. I knew the officer had asked me a question, but I needed him to repeat it. Are all the rooms in your house under video surveillance? I didn't want to answer that question, but I knew I had to answer honestly. No. The living room is the only room that has a camera. He nodded his head understandingly, scratching his chin thoughtfully. And how long have you had a camera in the living room? I shrugged and admitted, it just recently. Our dueling glances were interrupted when Mary screamed and pleaded, Chris, what the hell is going on? Please, please help me. I was about to respond when one of the young officers shouted, Sir, this is a police investigation. Please leave immediately. He was addressing an elderly man standing in the open front door of my house. With the same authoritative look, the man said, I am an official bailiff and I have been assigned to serve Mrs. Mary Harrington. He approached Mary, and all three officers took a step toward him, just in case the situation got out of hand. The man asked, Are you Mary Harrington? When Mary nodded, he handed her an envelope and said, Mary Harrington, you are being served. In addition to the divorce petition, you have been issued a restraining order preventing you from going near Mr. Christopher Harrington, his home and work. Since Mary was handcuffed, he handed the envelope to the officer who held Mary by the elbow. When the bailiff left, I turned to Mary. I watched the panic and confusion disappear from her face. They were replaced by a calmness. She looked at me and asked, How did you find out? Mike told me. As the two younger officers escorted Mary to the back of the patrol car, the third officer gave me his business card and asked me to send a copy of the videotape. I walked him to the front door and watched the first car drive off with Mary. The senior officer stopped halfway up my driveway. He turned and asked, 
I've seen you at the pit stop sometimes, haven't I? Yes, I recognized you in Sarge. He told me, Four years ago, I divorced my wife for adultery. I pay alimony, child support, health insurance, and a mortgage on the house she lives in with my kids and her asshole boyfriend. Maybe the next time I see you at the pit stop, you'll let me buy you a beer and tell me what the hell happened here today. I went to work the next day and was able to be somewhat productive as I survived Thursday and Friday. I even groaned loudly when I got home Friday night and found my father-in-law sitting on the front step. Pulling into the garage, I got out of the car and yelled, Get in here, Steve! When he walked in, I was already pouring two very large glasses of Knob Creeks. We sat at the kitchen table, slowly sipping our drinks, for many minutes before he asked, Did she cheat too? I just nodded. Is there any hope? He inquired. I took two more slow sips before I could calm down enough to be kind and respectful to Steve. I replied, It's been more than once and with more than one man. I took another sip and then told Steve the plain truth. And it wasn't with one man at a time. He looked at me in disbelief, and before he could respond, I told him, I've seen pictures and videos that made me want to puke. Steve shrank back in his seat and turned white. A tear ran down his cheek. We sat together for a long time. Each of us was immersed in our own thoughts and memories. Mary and Jenny didn't learn this behavior from their mother or me. His intense gaze was simply icy. Everyone knows that. A few more minutes passed before Steve rose to his feet and walked around the table. When I stood up, he hugged me tightly and snuggled into my shoulder with a sigh. Letting go of me, he strode toward the door with the same gait of a 90-year-old man. Opening the door, he looked over his shoulder and said, Burning those books was a shitty thing to do. And I'd completely forgotten about the trick I'd used to start the altercation with Mary. I almost screamed when I said, Wait! I walked out of the kitchen and returned a few seconds later with a small box. I held it out to Steve. As he opened it, he looked at me with a stunned expression on his face. I told him, I know you treasured those books, and I would never destroy them. Then how... He was too shocked to finish his thought. I told him, I went to the bookstore and bought a copy. That Saturday morning, I was sitting at the kitchen table as usual, scanning our local newspaper on my tablet. I smiled as I read it. Hartford Times, local section. West Hartford police are investigating a brutal attack on a local man as he left a neighborhood bar in the Elmwood neighborhood. And Michael Charmuth was attacked in the back parking lot of Topps Bar at approximately 10.30 p.m. His injuries were extensive and required hospitalization. A city police spokesman said police have several leads and expect to make an arrest soon. It was a bright and sunny November morning. I watched as a red Ford SUV parked a few spaces away from me and the driver slowly got out of the car. Hey Mike, you look like shit. I was in the parking lot in front of Jackson Physical Therapy and sitting on the open back door of my Ford F-150 pickup truck. A little birdie informed me that Mike had an appointment for 10.30. I continued. It would be nice if you could get a handicapped sign so you could park in a spot closer to the building. You know, like other cripples. In addition to the damage to his knees and feet, Mike had a shattered jaw that will be fixed with wire for at least another month. Cat got a tongue, asshole. I asked with a smirk. I had to hand it to Mike. He waddled over to me, leaning on his cane, and stopped ten feet away from me. He knew that Scott and I had been questioned by the police and later exonerated, but I suspect in his gut he knew we'd had something to do with beating him up. Now he knew it for sure. The hatred in his eyes was palpable. I'm sure he envisioned grotesque torture that would take months. I was sure Mike and I would meet sometime in the future. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life looking over my shoulder, so I arranged this meeting. And Mike slowly turned around and took the first step when I said, Mary Marie Charmuth from Milford, Connecticut. When he turned around, I continued, Susan Burke of White Plains, New York, and Lori Fitzpatrick of Brockton, Massachusetts. 
The hatred in his eyes was replaced by confusion. If anything happens to me, if I get in a plane crash, drown on vacation, fall down the stairs, I've arranged for my friends to visit your mother and sisters. I noticed a slight tremor in his hand as he held his cane. My friends will beat their faces as they did yours. They will damage their legs like they damaged yours. And Mike? I wanted to make sure he was listening intently. My friends will beat them in the crotch just like they beat you. I waited a few moments while he digested the information before I finished. While your mother and sisters are squirming in pain, my friends will tell them that their beating was your fault. I was surprised. Mike stared at me for a few long moments, then nodded quickly. I wasn't sure if he was nodding in understanding or declaring a truce. He turned and stumbled toward the entrance of the building. I'm happy to report that this was my last contact with Mike Charmuth. I had given my divorce attorney the power of attorney necessary to handle all legal matters related to our separation. We had no children. We made about the same amount of money. Most importantly, I didn't care about anything other than separating from Mary. A few weeks after I sued Mary, I got a call from my shark. She told me, We have reached an agreement almost exactly on the terms we discussed. However, Mary will not sign it until she has a chance to talk to you. I muttered a swear word and was advised, Just do it. Sit down and let her talk it out. Get it over with. Here's what I'll agree to. Have Mary sign the papers and you approve everything so it's official. I'll meet with her for an hour in a conference room in your office after she signs the papers. I heard, that should do it. And then the call ended. Three days later, I was sitting in the conference room. June, the paralegal, knocked on the door, opened it and said to me, everything is signed and notarized. She nodded and backed away from the door, leaving Mary standing at the entrance. She had clearly made some effort to get dressed and put on makeup, but it didn't matter. Mary was simply stunning, at least to me, even in her sweatshirt and ponytail. She walked around the table, leaned over and kissed my cheek, and then sat down across from me. Are you as nervous as I am? She inquired. At first I thought, what a weird way to start a conversation. But then I thought about her question. I shrugged and admitted, I'm not nervous. I'm more like worried. I want to get this over with and move on with my life soon. Tears ran down her cheeks as she told me. I was blackmailed. Mike was going to put the video of Jenny on the internet. Her father had called me early in the divorce proceedings and said the same thing, so I wasn't surprised. It may have started with blackmail, but I watched the video. I saw the whole thing. I was getting angrier by the second and I needed to calm down. After a few moments, I continued. You may have felt coerced, but that's no reason to destroy our marriage. Just because you found out that Jenny is a slut doesn't mean you need to turn into a slut. Mary exploded. I was so confused and saw no alternative. What could I have done? You could have, and should have. Trust me. I got angry when Mary rolled her eyes. I continued. Together with Jenny, we would have gone to the police and filed a report. We'll never know if the police managed to gather enough evidence to do anything. But we do know that his wife and employer would have found out, and we would have gotten a modicum of satisfaction. More importantly, we'd still be together. Unfortunately, you didn't trust me. Truth be told, I don't know if you trusted me at all. What the hell are you talking about? inquired Mary. I responded with a question to a question. Do you remember why we broke up the first time? The first time? You mean at school? Mary looked completely confused. What does that have to do with anything? In high school, you didn't trust me enough to tell me you wanted to help your neighbor Jimmy and go to prom with him. You've got to be kidding me. I was dumb and afraid to hurt my first serious boyfriend's feelings. Were you dumb in college too? I asked. When she threw me a questioning look, I continued. On Labor Day weekend, before you went to college, we made love on a raft on Lake Simpson, and afterwards we promised we'd stay faithful and get married after college. Your promise lasted ten days. Mary asked angrily, 
Are you telling me that you were completely faithful your first year of college? I shook my head and ignored her pointless question. What I'm saying is that, whether you agree or not, I doubt you ever trusted me. I don't think either of us would argue that I have every reason not to trust a word you say. You're an outright liar. And when you're not lying, you're playing word games and hiding the truth. Trying to change the direction of the conversation, Mary told me, I haven't seen Mike since all this trouble started. When I smirked, Mary asked, What? Mike had an accident. He can't perform at his previous peak level. What are you talking about? asked Mary. Grinning from ear to ear, I replied, Among his many injuries, both of his testicles ruptured. One of them was surgically removed. Her voice was barely above a whisper when she asked, How can you know? I know because I paid to make it happen. She covered her face with her hands and stared at me across the table. He's a cruel man, Chris. I'm scared for you. I met Mike a few weeks after his accident, and we had a very civilized conversation. I'm pretty sure I convinced him of the need to end our association. The look on Mary's face changed from frightened to enamored. I'd seen that look countless times over the years. You still love me she almost shouted. I was so surprised by her outburst that I laughed. Mary was visibly upset and said, You can't tell me you don't love me. I shrugged and told her, You're right. I can't say I don't love you. But I also can't say I love you. But you have to understand that I don't want to waste my time and energy trying to nurture the love I still have left in me. Mary almost exploded. Why did you even say that? It's simple. I looked her straight in the eye and said, You're not worth it. Mary leaned back in her chair and visibly shrank back. Tears continued to flow down her cheek, and I could see that she was breathing through her open mouth. I reached into the folder on the table in front of me and pulled out three photographs. One by one, I placed the pictures in front of her. The main thing for me is that my future children and I deserve someone better than this vile woman as our mother and wife. Goodbye, Mary.